Okay, okay. That, okay. If he's done anything wrong in this video, it's that. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. hold up. We, we need to talk about that. Time out. Let's, let's just all take a time out. Let's take a deep breath. We need to talk about some of the questionable science communication and pop science that is circulating on social media. And some of it's gonna come from sources that I'm sure a lot of people down the lens trust, love, and enjoy watching. To get the elephant out of the room, I'm talking about a video that I recently came across by Veritasium on the Many Worlds Hypothesis. Now I know this video is not new, it's like around four or five years old. Frankly, the only reason that I'm making this video is because I had to make it for my quantum physics class. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there are some things that are done really well in the video and we're gonna talk about those, but there are some very disturbing things towards the end of the video. Things just got out of hand. That are definitely sending the wrong message to the public, not just about quantum mechanics, but also about the scientific method in general. By the way, if you're new here, my name is Eric Hess and I'm an astrophysics student at the University of Calgary. For the past three years, I've been teaching physics and astronomy to thousands of Alberta students, so I wear the brunt of questions that students get when they watch videos like Veritasium's and then develop some pretty wacky and questionable interpretations of reality. So the first thing that Veritasium does is shows you this beautiful visualization of a solution to the Schrodinger equation. If you don't study physics, the Schrodinger equation is basically the end-all be-all equation that describes how particles evolve over time. They might be stuck in potential wells, which you can picture a skateboard in a half pipe the, the skateboard and the skateboard are riding the skateboard is stuck in the half pipe and you can't really leave the half pipe unless you apply energy in some way. Another possibility is you have just a skateboard on flat ground and there's no half pipe and that would be a, just a free particle um, where there is no potential well. And what that develops into is a classic physics equation, which is a, a partial differential equation. It's a, it's a type of heat diffusion equation. And, and, and Veritasium, Derek, uh, correctly states that the particles will tend, their, their wave function will tend to diffuse, to flatten out over time. And, and that's no surprise looking at the equation. If a physicist looks at Schrodinger's equation, they see that it's a heat diffusion equation. We study these in our program. So yeah, I think the beginning of this video does a beautiful job giving the viewer a visual and an intuition for what Schrodinger's equation actually means, which I think is fantastic. So I'm gonna give this two thumbs up. All right, so then he starts diving into this concept of probability and Max Born, and he gives you some history, he gives you some nice photographs of the scientists as well, a bit male dominated here. This is, uh, this is a really, uh, tens and twenties. Max Born basically comes up with this idea, look, you know, the wave function sometimes has complex numbers in it. If you don't know what a complex number is, it basically arises from what the square root of a negative number would be. Uh, if you remember square roots from school, typically can't take the square root of a negative number. But if we allow ourselves to take the square root of say negative one, and we set that equal to some random letter i, maybe not so random, and we start injecting these into equations, it just becomes a more convenient way of writing sines and cosines, trigonometric functions. So you, you often see this in physics where we kind of start injecting imaginary numbers to make the math a little easier. And what Max Born says is, hey, look, if we square this wave function and we take its norm, what that means is we'll get rid of the complex part of the wave. And that, mathematically, that's very helpful because you can't have an imaginary probability that doesn't make any sense. For instance, if I have a dice right here, six-sided dice, regular non-loaded dice, there's a probability that it's gonna land on a one, a three, a six, and we could go through and calculate the expected probabilities of this dice. There's no imaginariness to this. Every side has a fixed probability, it's very real. And so Max Born's basically just saying, hey, look, if we square the function, take the absolute value or the norm, we'll get rid of that. Uh, imaginary component that we injected in there to make our notation easier from earlier. Oh, that in no way explains it. Classically, if you want to know the position and momentum of a particle, you just measure it. It's not that bad. In quantum, in order to measure anything, you have to interact with it. And in interacting with it, you change it a little bit. And so your measurement can sometimes dictate what 
observation you make. It can kind of randomize the results that you get from analyzing quantum systems. And so uh, we get this famous quote from Einstein, God doesn't play dice with uh, the universe. And of course, what he's referencing is that if you had total knowledge of the system, like God would, you wouldn't have to roll the dice and just get a random number that would represent a particle's position, for instance. I mean, imagine if physics class in high school pretty much just boiled down to you having to roll the dice and getting a number. Um, yeah, I don't think that would take a whole lot of skill. Now, I imagine that a lot of you have questions and possibly objections to this, so I went to the expert. Okay, okay, that, okay. If he's done anything wrong in this video, it's that, right there, where he says, I, I imagine that you've got questions, so I went to the expert. Now again, this video is four years old, so he might not shoot this video the same way. He might not film this video the same way today. But that's not how science works. That's not the scientific method. There's no nowhere in the scientific method of research, hypothesis, experiment, results, test, conclude, write your report, and do it all over again. Do we ever say, you know, I have questions, I'm just gonna to go to the expert and have an expert tell me what is right and what is wrong. Th this, this is a cognitive bias that we have. We tend to think that people who have, you know, educated positions or positions of power have authority over certain knowledge. And this starts to feel very, <laughs> dare I say it, church to me. You know, it's like we've gone to physics church. You know, we have questions and we gotta to go to the physics pastor to <laughs> tell us, um, where we've gone wrong with our physics or, you know, how we're misinterpreting the, the physics. This isn't the scientific method. We don't go to experts. We go to cold hard facts. So if you want to get answers to a question, a burning question that you have, you either apply the scientific method and you iterate until you get an answer, or you go to the literature. Some researchers did that for you. Some more researchers did that for you over and over and over and over and over again until we get something like Planck's constant defined to like 10 digits because we're not you know, we're not interested in measuring that anymore. We're just going to call it a constant because we all agree with one another. That's how science is supposed to work. Bunch of cold hard data being backed up over and over and over and over again by a bunch of independent and often competing parties. That's something that's often left out of the scientific method that people don't think about. There's, there's often competing parties here. Like these research fields are tiny. There's only so much funding that goes around and you have to compete for the money that you, that you earn in order to run your experiment. And so these are competing parties in, within the same field. And so when they agree on something, you need to go, okay, well, we've got, you know, it's like two different teams, right? You've got Calgary Flames and Edmonton Oilers and somehow they're agreeing on something. Okay, well, this is probably objectively true. Nowhere in the scientific method do we go to the authority figure and ask for information because that's somebody else doing the thinking uh, for us. We're not doing the thinking anymore. We're not basing any of this off of data anymore. We're just going to an authority figure. So this really bothers me. This should not be in the video. What we're gonna learn is some interesting stuff, I'm sure, but this should not be in the video. This is not how, how science is done. Okay, so I wanted to make this video about many worlds, but I was concerned I was gonna screw it up. So I've come here to uh, meet Caltech professor Sean Carroll, who has literally written the book on many worlds. Here's the book, Something Deeply Hidden, available <laughs> wherever books are available. <laughs> oh, come on, this, like, so not only do we have the, the authority figure, Derek's gone to the authority figure to get the answer, now we've also got the authority figure selling merch. What? Like, that's just cringy. That's just cringy. And you know what's crazy about this? This is probably a good book. I'm not saying don't buy the book. I'm not saying hate on Caltech here. Kick him out and burn his clothes. I'm just saying, you know, we've gone to an authority figure and now they're trying to sell us their book. All right, so if there's anything I want you to take away from this video, it's really two things. Number one, the multi-worlds hypothesis is a philosophical interpretation of some wacky results from quantum mechanics. There's no proof of other worlds, dimensions, uh, the Spider-Verse, the MCU Multiverse. There's no proof of any of that. It's just a philosophical interpretation to make quantum mechanics make sense to a human. And number two, the scientific method does not involve going to an authority figure for accurate information. The scientific method empowers each and every one of us 
to critically think about the world around us, sort through the data, and actually find objectively true and verifiable information. So I don't want to encourage anybody down the lens to go to an authority figure the way that Veritasium did in order to get an answer. Because if you do, what's inevitably gonna happen is when you go and confront somebody about something that you just recently found out with your authority figure, they will inevitably go to their authority figure that backs up what they say, and all you're gonna have is just this conflict that can never be resolved. The only way to really find objectively verifiable information is to consult the data, is to consult the literature, and I know that there are a bunch of paywalls and other reasons why scientific literature is inaccessible to the public, and that's a problem that we need to address as scientists. But it doesn't mean that you go to an expert just because it's easier, just because it's more convenient, or just because it confirms something that you already believe. If you want an example of how the scientific method works in action, check out this video right here, which was actually narrated by a colleague of mine when we observed an asteroid that almost hit Earth.